we can go ahead and get started. Some people might trickle in, but uh, if not, like Gia had mentioned, this session is being recorded, so we will be posting it for um, other students who maybe weren't able to attend live to be able to watch. So first of all, Rose, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, could you please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Rose Frankel. I was at Hunter Macaulay. I graduated in 20, I keep forgetting if it was 18 or 19 because I graduated early, but one of those years. Um, I majored in media studies with a minor in writing, but I focused mostly on creative writing. Um, when I was in college, I started working part-time for my current boss at, well, it wasn't Pocket Watch yet. I started work working for my boss um, because I was introduced through Macaulay Professor Robert Small. Um, so from there, when I graduated, I became my boss's assistant and then manager and then um, director. So I've been at Pocket Watch since the company started and also since I graduated. Um, <clears throat> and at Pocket Watch, we create a lot of different kids media content. We say that we like to be everywhere that kids are. Um, so as you guys probably know um, just in general from like the media landscape but especially if you have little kids in your life um, kids don't really stick to tv like we did um, they're like on youtube and on their ipads and like that's really mainly how they digest content um, so our goal is to not just be on tv we want to be in their ipads we want to be on um, in games we want to be in podcasts anywhere that they might consume media because it is definitely not one place anymore um, and yeah, that's kind of my trajectory, I guess. I've been I've been a pocket watch this whole time <laughs> since I graduated. That's really amazing. And yeah, the scope of media has really changed since we were little. So it's kind of crazy. Um, could you share a little bit about your undergraduate experience at Macaulay Honors? I know you mentioned that Professor Robert Small played a role in how you kind of got to where you are today. So could you tell us about like the activities you were involved in and what you learned from them? Yeah. Um... In terms of like media specifically, Robert Small was like the definitely the most important part of my Macaulay experience um, because I, I I was at Hunter like I I went to Hunter which um, they do have a really good film and media department but in general Hunter is more of like a science focused school um, and I I thought I was gonna be science mostly because I was scared to commit to media at first but um, it was like once I pivoted to media, like I found Robert Small's class um, and I kind of forced myself into it because I technically wasn't allowed to be because it was in my freshman year and you're like not supposed to, you're not supposed to take the like Macaulay courses while you're a freshman because they don't want to overwhelm you. Um, but I like begged my advisors and introduced myself to Robert Small um, and he was the best and like helped me get into the class, um, even though I technically wasn't supposed to be there and like figured out a credit system and whatever. He's amazing. Um, but yeah, I got to help out with all the film festivals starting from when I took that class, which was amazing. Um, getting to learn about the transmedia marketing aspect of it, but then the, also like the actual watching of the films and putting the festival together. Um, and then when I was at the festival, I did a lot of the filming of the event. So that's really where I learned how to work a camera, um, which was a lot. And I still struggle with honestly, because it's, it's just a lot to learn. So it was really cool to have that class through Macaulay. Um, so yeah, definitely Robert Small's film class was like the best media experience that I had. And also Hunter's, Hunter has a TV studio class that was really cool. Um, but yeah, those are my biggest Macaulay media experiences. Oh, and I helped my friends. My friends um, used to lead a, a dance group called McCrew. Um, so I used to film their events. I filmed like one or two of theirs. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Yeah, that's really amazing that you, had so much experience through it and that I love how you said you were kind of into the sciences and you kind of forced your way into media classes because I think a lot of us share the same experience of thinking we wanted to do something else and then kind of pivoting after we're like oh hey this looks interesting. Um, so I know you mentioned Pocket Watch and you've been there since the beginning and currently you are the director of content development. Could you walk us through what a typical day looks like for you at Pocket Watch as the uh, director of content development? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's changed drastically since COVID, at least for now, hopefully it'll get back to like normal. Um, but one of my favorite things about being not just a pocket watch, but like in this industry in general is that every day is different. 
um, in normal times at least. <laughs> um, there's some days I will be at my computer a lot. It's a lot of writing, um, a lot of, sometimes it's a lot of writing of like actual scripts. Sometimes it's more treatments and I'm in development, which means I do a lot of the pre-production stuff. So like the creating of the show and the developing of the show before it goes to production, um, which is where a lot of the writing comes in, like especially for pilots and, and the stuff like and pitches, a lot of pitch writing. Um, so that's a big part of my job. Um, some stuff like budgets and stuff comes into play. Um, and then in normal times, I was on set a lot too. Um, so I was flying back and forth to LA a lot because that's where our company is based. We have like a very small office in New York. Um, it's me and my boss, my boss's assistant and a few animators that are here. Um, and then the company of like a hundred and so or so people um, are out in LA. So we would have to travel there a lot to be, anytime we were on set, it was in LA. Um, and then for any type of meeting that we had to attend, it was also out in the main office. Um, so, and then being on set depends on the show, but it was always a very fun, different experience. Hopefully we'll get to go back to that very soon. Yeah, that's, um, I'm sure you're probably not flying a lot these days, but that is really awesome that you get to go back and forth between New York and LA. And I was wondering if you could tell us what the most fulfilling part about, or exciting part about your work is, because you mentioned you're involved in pre-production, but you're also there on set. So that's kind of the production aspect. What is like the best part for you? So that's, that's always an interesting question. Cause like I, it, it goes back and forth, I guess, depending on what show I'm working on. Um, but also it's, for me, it really is just the fact that I get to do both. Um, like I, I love that. Um, and I, that might also be like specifically a development thing um, that I get to be part of like the initial writing stages and then see it through to production, which is a really cool thing to watch like just being like from the very first log line which is like the sentence or two summary of the show like from the very first brainstorming sessions of that like to to it actually being on a real set um is just such a cool thing to get to be a part of and to follow along and and to yeah I mean to be part of every step is like probably my favorite part <laughs> have a yeah. hand in everything <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I'm sure it's very satisfying at the end when you get to see everything come together. And I know you mentioned that you've been working at Pocket Watch since the company first started in 2017. And recently, just last year, you were honored as a 2020 Synopsis Rising Star um, in recognition for your significant contributions to the quickly growing company. And so I wanted to ask you, how has your experience of being with the company since the very beginning been? And has that affected your career in any way? Yeah, for sure. Um, like I said, so the way I got my job was very, it, it was, um, I started, like I said, I was introduced to my boss through Robert Small when I was still in college. So I started as my boss's part-time, like, I don't even think it was an assistant position. I think I was just like part-time helping him research for something for his nonprofit company. Um, and then while I was doing that, Pocket Watch launched. Um, so I kind of slipped into the assistant role when like the company launched and he needed more help and like everyone he knew wanted to spend a meeting with him and that type of stuff. Um, so I, I, it was like a lot of learning on the spot um, while I was still in school, um, which was fun and a little bit overwhelming at times, but definitely super fun. Um, so to get to start in that way where like, I was even technically like hearing about Pocket Watch before the company started, um, put me in a, really cool position to be able to grow with the company. Um, I think I, it's been, oh, it's, it has, it was just my four year anniversary pocket watch. So I went from assistant to director in four years, which I can't believe. Um, and is a lot of that is because my boss is really awesome and gives me a lot of opportunities. Um, but I definitely think that the company being young helped with that because in a startup, like startup culture, I think in most industries, um, you kind of have to wear like every single hat and like if someone asks you to do something even if you don't know how to do it you kind of just have to figure it out um so not just for me but like a lot of other people at the company we were all kind of doing a million different things when we first started like when i was an assistant i was doing things where like in a company like disney like assistants would not be doing the type of things that i was doing um so in terms of that like in terms of me getting those types of opportunities and and just the amount of stuff there was to do versus the amount of employees we had. Um, I think that being at Pocket Watch, like it definitely was, was helpful to grow that fast. 
Yeah, and congratulations again on your wonderful achievements and being able to be with a company that's grown so much in um, a few years. And so I kind of want to backtrack a little bit. I know you mentioned like going into Robert Small's class as a freshman, but what made you decide to pursue a career in media or kind of where did you decide like at this point, okay, I want to do media and I'm not really into the sciences? So in high school, I was like always obsessed with like my television, like way more than like a normal person. Um, like my favorite shows, like there was that hour on Comedy Central with um, Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart. And that was like my favorite hour of TV ever. Um, and it never really clicked for me that like there were people working on that. Like it was just my favorite. Like I loved SNL. I loved like all those shows. Um, and then it was like always my goal, like as a teenager, like when I turn 18, I'm gonna see them live. Cause like you weren't allowed to see them live until you were 18. Um, so on my 18th birthday, I saw um, Stephen Colbert's show live. Like it was the Colbert Report at the time. It was like one of his last shows actually. Um, and I kind of had that epiphany moment, like while watching them do all their behind the scenes stuff. Like during, I don't know if you guys have seen any live tapings in the city, but you definitely should if audiences come back. Um, it's free and it's so fun, especially if you're into like, if you're into TV just as like a fan, but also if you're into media, it's just so cool to see. Um, and all the shows do it. You can go to like One Iota. I don't know what The Daily Show is on nowadays, but they, one day they'll do audiences again. And like John, uh, John Oliver does it too. Um, sorry, an aside, go see live tapings. Um, but I went to the Colbert one and I just kind of was watching them like in the commercial breaks when they all huddle around the desk. Um, and like do their little like re like they recap what happened and like what the next plan is and they're like writing really quick script notes. Um, it kind of clicked to me that like oh like people do this for a job like this is a thing like this show happens because there's a whole team of people on it. Um, and that's kind of when it was like okay I have to do this. Um, so I had that moment and I remember being super upset after I had that moment because I was like the goody two shoes like high school student who was taking like five different AP, I mean, like you guys all were because you're on Macaulay, um, like the super overachiever, like I want, I'm gonna be a doctor, lawyer, whatever. Um, I was gonna be like a marine biologist or something. I was leaning towards, I still love biology, but I was gonna do something biology related. Um, and I kind of just got scared because I was like, media is so unsafe. Like everything you hear about in these schools are like, you're not gonna find a job. It's so scary. Like don't go into the arts. And the thing I wanted to do was like writer. Like that was the thing that called to me, which is, like even like it's just a very scary thing to like decide you want to do something in the arts because of all the stigma and stuff around it um so when I applied to Macaulay it was with the I still was like very practical like I still wanted to do the sciences and then I took chemistry 102 I think it was and I was like yeah this isn't happening like after two weeks I was like this there's no way um like literally crying to get through my homework none of it making sense like not failing, but like not doing, I, it wasn't clicking. Um, and that's kind of when I said, you know what, like, this is stupid. I'm not, uh, there's no way I can see myself like in a lab. Um, I know what I want to do and I just have to like do the best I can to get there um, because I will not forgive myself if I like stay on this track that I, that I chose. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's, that's like my, my origin story for wanting to do creative stuff, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us because I, I think we are told a lot often that, you know, the arts are risky and it's like a battle between like, oh, is it realistic or is it kind of a passion, but it's wonderful that it's worked out for you and kind of going into your role, you know, you've developed, produced and wrote a number of episodes, um, but specifically for the daytime Emmy nominated number one show on preschool television, which is Ryan's mystery play date on Nick Jr. Uh, which features Ryan's world, which I know is he's like taken off on YouTube at such an early age. It's amazing how he's been able to do that with his family. Could you tell us more about this experience and your experience with working with your team from, you know, pre-production pre all the way into when the show's actually been put out to being nominated for an Emmy? Yeah. So again, that's one of those things where like, even the company is just like, like it, it just took off so quickly. Um, like I was, I think like around when I started working with my boss was when they signed Ryan to start working with him. Um, but yeah, we, we were working with Ryan for a few months before, or maybe even like at least a year before we started developing, um, the Nickelodeon show. And at first it was going to be 
it, it was cool to like be involved from the very, very beginning because at first our, our only kind of instruction was like, it has to somehow be related to unboxing. Like that was the thing that we were trying to figure out because that was at the time what Ryan was most known for. Um, being a little kid who unboxes stuff on YouTube. So we were like, how can we take that and turn it into like a, a premium show for Nick Jr. that is also educational. Um, so through that and bringing on um, some, it was, it started off as like, it was just me and my boss. And then we brought on Jeff Sutphin, who is amazing and one of the executive producers on the show. Um, he, like the three of us kind of with Nickelodeon, um, it developed from like, how can we like unboxing? Okay, maybe we like unbox, there were, we had a whole bunch of different, I'm, I'm trying to remember like the initial concept, but it was like a page of like five different ideas. And then we like narrowed it down to unboxing of like a play date of like a mystery guest. So it became Ryan's mystery play date because we were gonna like unbox someone with a really cool career. Um, and then it, got to pilot in like a ridiculously short amount of time like it went from one sentence to like an actual film show in like a year or less which is not normal and crazy um and i think part of the nature of being in the kids space was that like we wanted to like we wanted to jump on it and also youtube like we we wanted to jump on it and we did and i and we pulled it off somehow um but the i mean the production team was amazing um but yeah just again like and i i, I don't think the the way that happened was normal like I think normally a show takes a way longer time to go from like a sentence to a show so I was very lucky to be part of that like whirlwind um but it was just really like having an amazing team and just being able to work with like what we were given in such a short amount of time and then we had a little bit more time like in between seasons like as the show went on like figuring stuff out and seeing what worked and but yeah getting to <laughs> having to work like that quickly to put something on Nick Jr was was a little bit insane um but it was very cool and definitely because of how good the team was and how crazy their brains are yeah that's amazing i didn't realize that one year is actually considered like a short amount of time to go from oh, God. like the beginning to airing a pilot that's crazy yeah, my boss yeah he albie hecht is my boss by the way he is um he is the chief content officer of Pocket Watch, and he was formerly the president of um, Nickelodeon, and he was head of development when all the shows that at least I watched as a kid um, came out, like SpongeBob and Dora and, and all those. Um, he, we would like be on set, and like I swear, like every other day he would turn to me and be like, "This is not how it normally happens. Like, don't get used to this," because normally it can take a year just to like get a pilot, like greenlit. Like it's a very long process to sell something to a network and to plan for a pilot and to get all the approvals through the network and like lots and lots of red tape and, and all that stuff. Like it can be close, I would say closer to like two or even three years in some cases, depending on the show. Um, so yeah, it's it, it was insane and not normal the way Ryan sped up. And a lot of that is because of how great our team was. And a lot of it is because of how big Ryan is and Nickelodeon being really great and also recognizing the, um, the importance of like getting it out. Um, but yeah, definitely TV takes a very, I mean, depending on like what, if, if TV is your interest, depending on like what area you go into, that stuff takes a very long time, TV shows. The, one of the reasons I was actually drawn to late night in, in the beginning was its pace um, because you have to put out a new show every single night um, which to me was like mind blowing. Like you would just spend the whole day working on one show and then you would film that one show and then the one show would be over and then you just start again the next day. Um, but yeah, like serialized TV and, and that type of stuff takes takes so much longer. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just amazing the way things work behind the scenes. But uh, could you talk, so you've had many achievements. I'm sorry if there's some barking in the background, but could you talk about an achievement that you're most proud of so far in your career? Although I'm sure you might have multiple given how many wonderful successes you've had. Dave, um, I don't know. I just, I guess I just don't really like think of it that way. Maybe it's because like, not, not that I've like done so much, but it's just that we're always working on so many things at once. Um, like, like even the past few months, like, okay, here's a, here's one of them. Um, when we all had to go remote, it was like a big adjustment for everyone. Um, 
but it was also around the time that we signed our new partner, Diana. Um, so this show, the animated show, Love Diana, which is on YouTube now, um, my team produced basically the entire thing, like from when we first started developing it to when we, like it was actually being posted um, from quarantine. Um, so a team from literally we're all around the country, all around the world, um, because Diana doesn't live in the States. So it's, it's, I can't believe the work that our team has put in to like get to this point. Like I'm, I keep, like, I have to watch the animation and like the way we're just keep it, we keep getting cooler and cooler animation coming in. And the fact that we did it without one in-person meeting. Um, I think I like even briefly met Diana, like one I think it was in March actually, like my last trip to LA, like when COVID was still a, like, is this gonna be a big deal? Like, I think I met her for like five minutes and then like everything came crashing down and then we somehow put on this show from our respective homes all around the world. And it's it's insane. Like I have a very talented team. That's the only way I can get anything done. Yeah, so you mentioned that you guys are able to like put this entire show together, you know, without meeting in person like you normally would. So what is like one skill attribute or strategy that has helped you or maybe your team most throughout either your careers or maybe even like through working remotely because of the pandemic? Um, I think being in production in general, like half the job, just even if in like a perfect world, half the job is putting out fires. So to work in production, you kind of have to be able to think on your feet in the way that we've been forced to. Um, obviously like no one expected this, but I think in general, everyone has like a level of ability and just like, you gotta be able to, to just deal with the punches. And again, this is like a completely crazy situation that no one saw coming. Um, but the ability to pivot is something that people in production I, th I think at least based on who I've worked with, all, all really have. Um, so like it took a few months of adjustment, um, a few like modifications of how we communicated, um, but we got there and we, we figured out new systems and we solidified our pipelines and all got really good at spreadsheets and like that type of thing. And we figured out how to do it remotely where like we put a bigger focus on animation than maybe we would have if we had been able to to actually like be with them in a studio. Um, so yeah, just just having that, sharpening the ability to just think on your feet and, and be able to, to deal with punches like that. Yeah, I'm sure that's very helpful for multiple industries and people interested in all different types of careers. And I kind of want to go back a little bit to how, you know, before joining Pocket Watch, um, you've interned as both a production and development intern uh, with various media companies, including NBC Universal Media and on the Late Night Show with Seth Meyers. So is there anything significant you learn from these internships that have helped you right now? Like maybe the fast pace, because I remember you saying that these shows are a lot faster than maybe other television shows. Yeah, so especially Seth Meyers, like when I first, when they first hired us, they basically said like, our show doesn't have PAs, so you're like the closest thing we have to PAs. Um, so it was a lot of like, that like PA type, uh, production assistant type work. So like um, running scripts places and, and making sure the crafty table looked nice and like keeping the kitchen organized and like the, the small stuff, but like the small stuff that the show needed to keep running. Um, so it's kind of just a, you, a lot of internships are just, you're doing a lot of small stuff because that's what an internship is, I feel like in any industry. Um, but you kind of really learn that like every little thing is helpful. Um, and then especially even as you like move up in the industry, like you from how heavily like you would rely on like interns or assistants and that type of thing, like you realize that every position really, really counts. Um, so it's cause sometimes it is hard to like not feel like you're doing busy work, but it, I think most of my internships did a really good job of, of kind of showing me that what I was doing had a use, like I wasn't just doing stupid stuff. Like it was, um, it, it all helped the team as a whole, which they needed in order to get the show done. Um, and then I think the biggest difference between, like not even between the departments, but just in general, um, again, back to like the difference of like smaller companies and larger companies and like startup culture, I would, I would get to do like more creative stuff at 
my smaller company internships than I would, than I got to do at a place like NBC. Um, which is why I think as you're looking for internships, like don't dismear just because you haven't heard of it, um, because you'll probably get your best experience at a place like that, um, because they will actually let you do stuff because they have a smaller staff and because they're more willing to listen to you or have the time or like there's less, um, less red tape in place to keep you from like being in on these meetings or helping in this way. Um, like I loved, I mean, it was a dream come true to like work at 30 Rock, but because it's 30 Rock and because it's NBC and because it's a huge corporation, there was like a lot of stuff that not only that like interns, it just wasn't their job, but like they weren't allowed to do. Um, so like one of my jobs at Seth Meyers, for example, would have been like standing at a door to make sure that no one walked into the shot, which is like important for what they're doing, but also like not nearly as hands-on as like a development internship at a small company called Cineflix where I got to like give them my opinions. I used, I got to like do a ton of research on like casting for a show and like give them my opinions on it. Um, so like, yes, like a smaller, less known company or show, but I got a lot more, I learned a lot more about like what an actual job would be in the future. Yeah, I like how you really brought attention to the difference between these big corporations and smaller companies because I think especially at Macaulay and just, you know, we want to do our best. So we always want a place that has a name to it. But sometimes, you know, the best places to learn aren't necessarily the ones that are already very established and have a more rigid system. Um, so kind of moving on from that, you know, are there any clubs, associations or organizations that you think students should join if they're interested in the media industry? And, you know, if you have, um, has your membership in any of these organizations impacted your career in any way? That's, organizations in the media industry are kind of hard, especially as students. Um, and even as like someone coming up, because like there's a lot of really weird ones where like, you can't join them unless you have credits, but then you're like, but how am I supposed to get credits if I can't join them to like get the, it's the same thing as like when you see entry level job and they require all this experience, you're like, but that's what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to enter. Um, so I would say as students, just like apply to literally every internship you see. Again, like don't get caught up on names, like look up your favorite, like think of like your favorite shows or shows you've watched or heard of and then like look up the production companies like don't just see like don't just look at like Netflix look at look up the production company that created the show um and that and like see if they're hiring for internships um and just put your application out anywhere um because it will be those like little those like little jobs which aren't little like they're really important um just build your resume and get experience because that experience and even being like a day player, like be on all those websites. Um, like I think entertainmentcareers.net it's called. And there, there's like a whole bunch of websites like that. And there's a whole bunch of Facebook groups. Um, like if you just look up like entertainment websites, like any of those listicles will give them to you and, and look on Facebook for the Facebook groups, um, like specific to your city. So like see if New York has like a PA type website where like sometimes people will post on these pages um like need a day player like it'll be like for no money but you'll get really cool experience and then you'll get to put something on your resume um so just being being really proactive and on the lookout for jobs that um that you like just do anything do anything that you can possibly get your hands on and that's especially being proactive is especially important um as a media student at Macaulay um, because, and I loved Macaulay. Macaulay helped me graduate without student debt. And I loved most of my teachers. And like, again, like Robert Small is the best, but like specifically like my school advisors, like it's a very, and I'm sure you guys know this being media students at Macaulay, like they're very focused on like the STEM kids and the law kids. And like, it's very easy to feel lost as a media student. Um, because like that's you like that's not what you're sort of aiming for um, and sometimes the advisors don't know how to help you as much because like you're the second student they've ever seen who doesn't want to be a doctor um, so like it's very important for you to be on top of chasing opportunities that you want and that's a lot of internet research um, and again like the Seth Meyers example like that did not come through Hunter or Macaulay um, and the only reason I even got my resume looked at was because I already had like four or five internships at these other companies on my resume. Um, it was just like 
luck and like my keywords were good on the resume and like the recruiter saw that like it wasn't it wasn't like my advisor was able to recommend me um because yeah they have yeah so just be very proactive like for yourselves like don't be afraid to cold cold apply to these things yeah that's really interesting that there's you know you look at a netflix show and you think oh it's like a netflix production but it's actually you know there are other companies that are involved and so kind of stemming off from all of the great advice you just gave do you have any advice for either current students or also for alum who you know are here with us today about where they can seek for some of these job positions or like does it get easier maybe like once you've graduated um anything um well i would say the first of all a lot of internships a lot of them say you have to be a college student but a lot of them also don't um so if you're struggling to build a resume like don't don't think you're above internships because like no one is when you're first starting um they're really hard to get to so like apply to internships too because anything anything to get experience like really anything experience at least to me and in my like through my college career like experience was the only thing that anyone even asked about um like at all my internship interviews and my job interviews like i've i've really only been asked about like my internships and stuff they weren't as or or like my real my real time experience um not as much like my classes at hunter and like that type of thing um because this industry is so like hands on and and like if they like you like they'll want to work with you that type of thing um so i would say to just again like look for stuff and apply as much as you can and don't turn stuff down just because you don't think it's exactly what you want to do or like if you think you're overqualified like if you're having a hard time finding something just like take something um especially the short-term stuff is good for that type of thing um i didn't think i would be in the kids industry it i kind of just fell into it um and it's really fun and i really love it but like it's not like I, I didn't see myself again like I was obsessed with late night when I first decided I wanted to do this um and I did not say no to it just because it wasn't like what I envisioned for myself um just like take what you can get and and run with it um is what I would say yeah that's that, that's great for a lot of us and especially with now with COVID I think opportunities are a bit harder to find and so being able to kind of find one and sticking with it is definitely something good and oh, look at the assistant mm -hmm. track too like don't just look at stuff on set um mm -hmm. because any the thing with this industry too is like anything can kind of lead anywhere like don't look at a linear path as your only option like i remember when i was at seth myers we had like these um informational interviews and at that point like because i was in production and like obsessed with late night and like anyone who goes for an nbc internship like all you hear about is the page program um so i asked the producer that i was in that like we were talking um with each other about that and he's like honestly like it's so saturated <laughs> like because that's like the thing that people know of and the thing that people go for because they think like oh like page job at nbc but like that's just not how it works for everyone and it is not the only way to get where you want to be in this industry so like being an executive assistant which like could be a lot of paperwork and scheduling and stuff like if you're an executive assistant for like the right person or at the right company like that can get you to a lot of places too so don't just don't even just look at set stuff look at like any sort of office anything like these companies that are adjacent to what you want to do yeah that's uh it's I never knew that prior to this that it wasn't as linear as maybe some other industry so I think that's comforting in a way knowing that maybe you start off somewhere you didn't initially want to be but there's always an opportunity to go from there into somewhere maybe more towards your passions or your interests. And so kind of talking about, you know, all these different ways to find a job in the industry, was there a time in your career where you faced a significant challenge or a setback? And if there was, what did you learn from it? Um, I've been super lucky with my career, because again, like, I mean, at least in terms of like job searching and stuff, like my situation is like very lucky and like Alvi has been my mentor um since I had started working with him and I've just in terms of like career growth I've been very very lucky um but I mean 
again, like I spoke to it a little bit already, but like a really big challenge for me when I was first getting started was just that idea of like, oh my God, I'm doing something creative and like, it's super unstable. And like, um, I had absolutely no connections or anything when I decided this, like I didn't have like the uncle and show business that like, you're going to run into, like, you're going to run into so much nepotism in this industry, but like in any industry. Um, but like, I didn't, I had like no connections at all when I first started. And that's just like a terrifying thing. And I didn't really have any friends that were interested in it either. Like, it was just a very scary, like, it was a scary jump to make when I felt like I knew absolutely nothing. Um, so just, and then again, like Macaulay was as helpful as they could be and my advisor's door was always open, but and, and I think this was also like Hunter Macaulay specifically, um, they're just more, they were more built to handle, like if I had been in the sciences, I think they would have like known way more about how to get me exactly where I wanted to be. Um, and my advisor was great. Like she was always there to help me when I like had questions or even just wanted to talk about it. But like, they just, again, like media is a weird industry. <laughs> um, so just kind of like having to, having to flounder in school a little bit was was hard for me. Um, but I was very lucky to, to find Robert Small's class um, within, I, I can't remember, I think it was my first year. Um, I don't know what I would have done <laughs> if I hadn't found that Macaulay class. Yeah, there's that's wonderful that we did have um, that one resource where you did find that Macaulay, which is that class that kind of led you to you know, Professor Robert Smaltz. So I know you mentioned about the different ways to find an internship, but is there like a certain resource, like a specific website uh, that's best for people who want to dive deeper into the media industry or even people who are just interested in getting to know the field better? Hmm. I'm trying to, I can like email you after for you to distribute if you want. Like I, I have it written down somewhere from a million years ago, but like entertainmentcareers.net is one of them. There's another like random one that has Hollywood in the name. There are like a few like entertainment job boards that you can look at um, that I found internships through. LinkedIn has stuff. Um, but again, like I've found a lot of stuff just by looking up like um, specific production companies in New York. Um, so like, yeah, like some stuff like I saw on Indeed and, and oh, and Hunter's job board is really good too. Like the, the different school job boards you should always check um but yeah it's like really just like look through the credits of shows and look up like like for example Bojack Horseman is like one of my favorite shows like you think of it as like a Netflix show but the company that like animated it was like Tornante I think productions like you wouldn't look for an internship in Netflix necessarily or you would but those would be way harder to, to like get than Tornante productions like that's a very specific example and I don't know if that's correct but like that example of like like Property Brothers, that's, you think HGTV, right? When you think Property Brothers, but Cineflix, which is the company I worked for is the one that developed that show. Um, so looking deep dives, do a lot of deep dives into spe specific shows um, and Facebook again, like for, especially for, for day player stuff. Don't, don't discount Facebook boards or whatever they're called, the pages. Um, and if you have people in your life that know anything, don't be afraid to ask them, even just to talk to them, like an informational type interview. If they can't like connect you to someone directly, they'll, they'll have advice or like a friend to talk to you or like that type of thing. Yeah, that would be great if you could send us some of those resources. We'll be more than happy to share them with the participants who either signed up or are here with us today. And there's always um, Macaulay Career Path so everybody can also check that out too, just kind of like a little shameless plug. Um, but I wanted to move on to uh, my next question, which is, what is something that you wished more people knew about just media or content development and the service and the industry as a whole that maybe isn't something you learned until you got into it? Um. I guess one of the things would be, I mean, like you kind of touched on, like, you don't realize how long this stuff takes <laughs> until you start like really working on it. Like there's, depending on what you're doing too, there's so many steps to certain things and so many approval layers. And as the company, like, depending on how big the company is, there's even more approval layers, the bigger the company is. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is just, I mean, learning that a career like this was possible was a big thing for me. 
Um, so just not being afraid of, of taking that jump um, and like knowing that there are people that do it so you can do it too. Um, like seeing them work behind the scenes, it's just kind of like, again, that moment of like, people are really doing this so it can be you. Um, and development also, like I, I didn't see myself in development just because I was so obsessed with being on set when I was a kid when I was a kid, like when I was first, when I say kid, I mean high school, um, like being on set was the thing that I really wanted to do. But then when I was in development, I realized like, oh wait, like there's all this other fun stuff where like you get to be on set and actually create the show. Like um, you can, there's a lot of different ways to get to where you want to be in media. And it's not just the one thing that you see yourself doing in 20 years, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And it's, there's just a lot of great information that you've provided that I think will be very helpful to everybody who's here or watching this recording later on. So we're kind of nearing the end of our session now. And so I'd like to open up um, to any of the students or attendees who are here. If you guys have any questions, since we are a relatively small group, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question and we'll just kind of go from there. So Rose, what would you say your real goal is still? Because you seem to, uh, you know, have an expressed interest in writing, and you're kind of doing that a bit now. So, you know. um, I kind of, I don't know. I don't know if I like have one anymore. I used to, but now I'm kind of just like doing what is fun. And right now, I'm having a lot of fun where I am, um, and seeing where it takes me. But I guess my ultimate goal is like my boss like has, he does everything like he is he's the um chief content officer at pocket watch but he also runs his nonprofit and where he gets to do like um really cool work that shows um they they show sorry my slack is going crazy i don't know how to turn off do not disturb um yeah like his nonprofit is amazing he does a lot of that type of work too so I guess doing stuff like that and like Keenan Thompson too, who like we got to, who we get to work with on some stuff and he's really awesome. And he, he does everything. Like he's on SNL, but he also writes some stuff and he's got a show on NBC now. Um, so to be someone like, like them where they do, they get to do whatever they want. <laughs> they get to do everything and whatever they want. I think that's my goal to, to do that type of thing. I don't want to be limited to anything. I don't know if that answers. That's probably like very general and not, and well, not well, a yeah, it was more just you know uh you know interview than gaining information i guess you know yeah i just um yeah i mean again like i think that's also a very unique thing about this industry is that you you're not locked into one thing just because your job title says something um like a lot of people even at my job like they're full-time at, at pocket watch but then like like my friend Frankie, who's on my team, like she's full time at Pocket Watch and she's an amazing producer. Um, but she also wrote her own play and I got to see it before quarantine happened. So like that type of thing. Um, you can really you can explore a lot of stuff and it's fun. I just want to be creative. That's my goal. I want to stay creative. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Brian, if you had more questions, you can go ahead and ask them. If not, I also have a few more questions. So uh, I don't know if Jaden or Harleen, if you guys also had questions, please feel free to just jump in. Yeah, hi Rose, uh, Jaden again. Um, I was wondering, you said you were a creative writing minor. What is it like working as a writer on a team versus you know just generating independent pieces for a class? Um. I guess it would be closer to, if you've taken creative writing classes, it would be closer to like the workshop feeling of things. Um, I've gotten better at it, but it was at first very, very scary for me to like show anyone else my writing. Like I always hated that, like in high school and in college, I hated having to like show other people what I was writing. And more so I hated having to like see or hear what I wrote, like read back to me. Um, and I still am not good at that. Like when I have to like watch animation of something that I wrote, like it's it's like when you hear your voice on like a recording, like it's that type of feeling and I don't like it, but like you have to be able to do it. Um, so it's a lot of it is developing a thick skin, like especially if you have someone who will be honest with you, like you don't want someone who's just gonna be like, good job, check, like that's not helpful. Um, what's helpful is when people like point out what's wrong with your writing and you just have to 
be willing and ready to accept that criticism and grow from it um, instead of like getting, and you also, it's, but it's that balanced with like standing up for stuff that you think belongs there. So like as a writer, like you do normally, for example, like if you get network notes on something, um, you have to follow most of them because the network is the one that's <laughs> creating the show, but you do have as the creative force behind what you're writing, you do have some power to be like, I'm pushing back on this note and here's why. Um, so kind of getting that confidence in your own writing and finding that balance of like doing your job and, and like doing what your boss tells you to do. Um, but also being able to stand up for like the few things that you really think belong there. Um, so yeah, accepting criticism is the biggest. <laughs> Taking and accepting and having your work criticized and torn apart and if sometimes even having it just completely killed and like you have to start all over. Um, having to do like a what's called like a page one rewrite. Um, just accepting that nothing you write is like set in stone and people can, can rip it apart <laughs> and being okay with it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Harleen and Brian, I don't know if you guys have any other questions. Well, I guess more generally, um, when it comes to people who have an interest in writing, you know, obviously, you know, finding work as a PA or whatever is typically what people say to, uh, you know, <laughs> to get your, uh, to get your stuff in people's hands and whatever. But you know, as it comes to just like making stuff in the first place, I'd heard from some people, I don't know if you ever took her class, but a professor from Aglitch. Uh, yeah, uh, she was yeah. the best. I yeah. loved her, yes. Um, but she was talking, she was always talking about how important it is to have stuff that you've already produced, uh, you know, to go yeah. along with this. Do you think that's true? That it's, uh, you know, vital? Yeah. Yep, I do. And I think that having stuff you've already produced doesn't necessarily mean professionally produced because it's so easy to like make your own stuff now. Um, like from YouTube to even TikTok and Instagram, like just make stuff, like just show, show who you are and what you can do. And it doesn't have to be professionally written or, I mean, it should like the writing should be good, but it doesn't have to be professionally shot. Like use your iPhone and like get across a point and like that can sometimes be enough to to point you out to someone um so I do think that like and not just not even just being produced but like having something ready to show someone like if someone sees you posted a funny TikTok and like that hits off with the right person and they somehow come to you and are like do you have anything ready like you should have like a packet of scripts and, and that type of thing like have have like a portfolio like any any arts career you should have some sort of portfolio that shows your best work um and again best does not mean highest budget <laughs> best just means um showing whatever talent you're trying to show if that makes sense thank you um okay so it's i'll go ahead and just ask another question keep things rolling but uh, Rose, so I know back in 2017, you actually published an article in the Huffington Post about um, a day on set where you actually wrote about your experience as a member of the productions team at the CUNY Film Festival at Macaulay. And so, you know, this kind of falls into the category of like experience and just having something on your portfolio. Could you share with us how, you know, whether or not this experience impacted your decision, like moving forward in the media industry and just your overall experience with the CUNY Film Festival? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, like that class was really, was so helpful to me for like a million reasons. Um, but any, like, that was one of my first experiences, I guess, of like a live event, which is very different than a not live event for many reasons. Um, so it's kind of, when you're doing anything live, it's like production mode on steroids, like in a regular production where you have all the time in the world um, and you can take as many shots as you need to get the shot that you want, things are gonna go wrong. Um, and live, when something goes wrong, it's a lot more thinking in the moment. And like, I think that, that event was helpful for that. Not that a lot of stuff went wrong, but just that like, it's a different type of adrenaline doing anything live. Um, so that was definitely, that that particular experience was helpful for that and live event. Oh, and by the way, again, back to like non-linear, 
my very first internship was at the Museum of Natural History in their public programming department. Um, I literally saw it and I was like, you know what, like I want an internship. I know I'm super young and like no one's going to want to hire me. Um, I sent out my application everywhere. I had somehow got that one and it was a lot of event planning stuff and like it's sort of production related because it was a lot of um, live events. <laughs> so like even like a little tiny bit adjacent to what you want is helpful. Um, but yeah, that that was definitely one of, I think maybe even my first like live experience, which was a good learning moment for me. Yeah, there's never going back when things are live, you just kind of have to roll with it. So yep, yeah. that's, um, I'm sure it's a very, like you said, adrenaline uh, based event. Um, so we have about a few minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just gonna say if like anyone's interested in like, if live TV or live events or whatever is something you're interested in, you want a cool thing to watch is like, um, they sometimes film the, the what's it called like video village which is where like all the screens live of like live events like the oscars and the emmys and stuff so if you look up like directors like doing their job during these events it's like you get so much like secondhand stress like i think they they do some from um the guy who, who directs snl like keep forgetting his name but like he wins the emmy every year for it um like they're if they used to have an snl exhibition on fifth avenue and like their part of it was like being in the video village and like hearing him make the calls and like it's it's just insane like look up those types of videos and like the oscars director like look up that stuff it's crazy yeah um it's i can only imagine how stressful that can be just being the one that has to make the calls but we have about five minutes left so uh, if anybody else again at this time has questions please just feel free to unmute and you can ask multiple questions at once. It's, we're a very small group today, so don't feel bad about asking too many questions. Well, I guess generally, what do you think is a good way to get your foot in the door other than just, you know, sheer volume of applications sent out? You know, like, is there something that people like to hear or, a way to like prove that you were, you know, a hard worker or really interested or anything like that? Um, I mean, I think going back to what you said of like, if you're having a really hard time finding something um, to get experience, just making your own experience, like have a reel, have, have a portfolio again of like, either stuff that you've produced or edited or written or, you know, even if it's a social media profile, like a TikTok account of like a bunch of videos, um, something, just anything to show people that you're eager, like show them physically, um, like that you can put in front of them and that they can watch or read. Um, and then that, that plus again, like it really is just a lot of, I, I must have sent in like a hundred applications before I got like one response. It really is a lot of that and it sucks. And I think that's with m many industries. Um, and again, like many industries, it's harder if you don't have some sort of connection um, or anything like, but don't, don't discount cold applying um, and just apply for everything. <laughs> It sucks. I know it really sucks. I wish I could like give you some sort of like secret to like make you get a job, but that's that's so much of it is just like being so insistent with like chasing stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do we have any final questions before we wrap up for today's event? Uh, if not, um, I'll go ahead and kind of move into the concluding of the event. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take the silence as a no, but uh, Rose, thank you so much once again for sharing with us your wonderful career trajectory and also the great advice and giving us a lot of tips on how to really delve into the media industry for those of us who are interested in the field. Um, and thank you everybody for attending our event and asking so many great questions. Uh, this event was recorded like Gia had mentioned and Rose if it's okay with you we will be sharing it with the students and along with some of the resources you send over. Um, so thank you everyone for attending and thank you once again Rose and we hope you all have a great day and great weekend. So thank thanks you. for coming. Thank you.